Okay, there's a storm here, so doing work is not going to be helpful. I was just getting ready to eat something, and I was looking at the counter. He always hits me at, at moments like this. And I was trying to come to grips with how it's possible for people to say that there's no privacy issue with Windows 10 when the very end user license agreement, typically called ULUT, says by contract in your face when you go to install it. Hi, we're going to collect, and these are Microsoft's own words, all of your typing, inking, and speech. How can you pretend that that doesn't exist? You can't install Windows 10 without it. You have to agree to that to install it. Microsoft is very upfront about this, and the part that they're not so upfront about, in fact, not at all, is that in the very agreement you're supposed to read before you agree, there is a link that you're supposed to read but you can't read it if you don't have a browser yet the link is called aka dot ms forward slash or backslash msa and I did a video on that back in July it's now November showing live that that particular agreement, which is part of the Windows 10 license in its own paragraph 14, that that agreement says that, hi, Microsoft has a right to slurp all of your data, private data, private. And it's claiming that right in the name of imposing on you a code of conduct which it doesn't really define. Terms like, don't do anything illegal, don't do anything harmful, don't do anything immoral. But it never defines what those terms are. And under the agreement in other parts of it, you are not allowed to take Microsoft to court. You are not allowed to sue Microsoft or go to court. Okay, so if Microsoft decides you're being illegal, it's your country instead of your country? Those are the provisions. They're in the document. I showed them live on screen, okay? You can read them yourself. Just type aka dot ms backslash msa and then look up its paragraph 3. See for yourself. Now, if you do that and you're a normal person, you will say, oh my God. There's never been an agreement like this for any product or service anytime, anywhere in history. Any competent lawyer would advise his client never to draft such language because what the person drafting the language is doing, the company, in this case Microsoft, is making itself your policeman. Okay, then if it's your policeman, then it's responsible for your behavior. Its policing job is responsible for your behavior. If it's asserting control over your life, then it's taking on the responsibility and liability for your misbehavior. That's what any competent lawyer would say. That's why there's no product. You, every product you buy, those products all say, Hi, we're not responsible for how you use this. Microsoft is doing the opposite. Now go read it yourself, because that's germane to you know my long introduction as usual about this audio. Anybody who reads that would know this. It's not hard. The language is right there in front of your eyes. So in order to claim that that's not a privacy issue, then you have to be incompetent. Or lying. There's no middle ground. So I was sitting here at my counter thinking about what I just said to you. 
And while I was thinking about it, he hits me with the fact that people are going to insist on what they want the truth to be, no matter what it really is. Okay? Hearing they don't hear, seeing they don't see. And it doesn't matter how obvious it is. Here are the examples of Microsoft Windows, but you know, there are thousands of examples. You know, the guy who's beating up his wife, why doesn't she leave him? Why didn't people get out of Hitler's Germany? Everything about the concentration camps and all that stuff was made clear between 1933 and 1938 because he wrote about it in his own book called Mein Kampf. Basically, he, in Mein Kampf, he tells you the Jews are not fit to live. So now this guy who says the Jews are not fit to live gets in power. What do you think he's going to do? And in 1938, you had Kristallnacht. And before that, in between those years, you had a constant hassling of Jews. Confiscating their property, saying how bad they are, all kinds of horrible things. And then, of course, just after Kristallnacht, that's when the concentration camp resettlement began. Especially in Poland, once Poland was taken over, because that was the primary you know, country that was used for it. Everybody knew. They didn't know 100% of all the details, but they knew that the Jews were being shipped out. And it wasn't just the Jews, it was also gypsies, homosexuals, communists. But they knew these people were being shipped out under inhumane conditions in cattle cars. To so-called work camps where they worked them to death. That was known. It was also known that they were being burnt. Because the smell of burning human flesh is something that carries for miles. So how do you turn a blind eye to that? We did. We did it before World War II you know, officially started. So how do people turn a blind eye to the gospel? How can you not know God exists when you look up at the sky? The answer is we do know. And I mean, my particular blindness and stubbornness is different from yours. And yours is different from the next person. So I'm not trying to, like, blame the atheist or something. We all see, but we don't see. Hear, but we don't hear. When we don't want. Now, the most important thing to say about that is, in trying to understand how does God integrate even hypocrisy and make good on everything, which is how I ended the last increment. A tangential or related question is, and we all have asked this, how is it that people in heaven still have free will? Considering the strength and power of will to block out the truth, that's part of the answer to the question. Because the flip side of it is, if you want something to be true, you'll call it true no matter what the evidence is against it. We're frequently accused of that by atheists. And to some extent, they're, they're right. We want God. So no matter what evidence the atheist thinks is against that notion, we're going to turn it down. Of course, the trouble that the atheist has is it's pot kettle black. The atheist is turning down evidence that proves God exists, and he claims it's not there. Okay. But it's not just those two questions. It's pretty much anything. So now we have a little piece of the puzzle to answer the question. How can you have free will in heaven and not sin? God created free will. Here is one of the characteristics of free will we see operate down here. If you want to believe something, you'll go on believing it no matter what the evidence is. If you want to disbelieve something, you'll go on believing, go on disbelieving no matter what the evidence is. We see it in our lives now. When I don't want something, I shut it off. Don't you? And we justify it. So we really do have an extremely strong power 
to say no. Even now in our sin nature bodies, even now as weak as we are. But we won't have the sin nature in eternity and we won't be weak like we are now then. But we have the same soul. We have the same will. So really what we can say is that while our seeming inability to say no now, first of all it's kind of bogus. It's really not an inability despite sin. And the second thing is, the weakness of the flesh is kind of hampering our use of our free will. But when you have more, then your free will is stronger, it's freer. And what really happens to people when they get what they want? They want more. You take away the shackles from somebody. What's the first thing a person's going to start doing? So all the stuff he, he wanted to do and couldn't. So then free will goes in the direction of free will's desires. That's the first thing. And the more power you got and the more ability you got, the more you're going to do that with your free will. So it's only when you're like circumscribed that your free will is circumscribed and, and you have to say, well, you know, I, if I want to be a ballerina and I can't, it's a famous Calvinist argument, they don't know how to define things. That's not, that doesn't tell you anything about my free will. My free will is I want to be a ballerina. Whether I can do so is a matter of other attributes that has nothing to do with will. It's having that will have power over something else. That's not free will. That's a separate power over something else. Okay? Irrespective of free will. Like, if I want to lift up my leg, but my leg is broken, if I want to move my leg, but it's broken, I can't move it. But that doesn't stop my free will from wanting it. You see the point? Okay, so then flipping this one step further, we will have much bigger, better bodies, much bigger, better abilities when we're dead, and we won't have any sin nature to hamper our free will. Because that's essentially what the sin nature does. It's like a drug. It's like an addiction that weighs against your free will. Most people, for example, are not going to just walk into a restaurant and stab somebody with a fork. They don't want to do that. But maybe if some patron in the restaurant pushes you and pushes you and pushes you and needles you and needles you and needles you, and needles you out of frustration you'll grab a fork and stick it in the person. But you're giving into the temptation of being needled by some outside force. The old sin nature the Bible keeps on saying is an outside force. It's in your body, but the real you is your soul. So it's trying to gain access to your soul. And that's something we all live with. So it's the constant needling of the sin nature. And you get tired of it and you give in every once in a while. But clearly your ability is to say no to. So that ability to say no doesn't have the da 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 in the eternal state. So of course you don't want to sin. Plus you got more knowledge, plus you got more ability, plus it's nice to live there. You're enjoying yourself. You know better. Where's the incentive to sin? See, this is something we got to understand because the core of the angelic appeal trial is why did Satan sin? Where was this? Inc what, what could have possibly motivated him to sin? He had everything. And that, that question has been asked by theologians many times. I don't know what all their answers are. The Bible says he got all proud of himself and that's why he sinned. I will make myself like the Most High, Isaiah 14, 14, I think. It's in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. 
starts off pretending to talk to the, you know, official king. I think it's a tire. But it's a foil. And it's deliberate foil. I am really talking the power behind the throne. Satan, you who are running the king of Tyre. You're really beautiful. You had it all until sin was found in you. And what was that sin? I will make myself like the most high. Why? Why would he want to do that? I honestly, God don't know. But that's not my sin proclivity. I got other sin problems. Okay, so won't there be some kind of need, as it were, like Satan had in the beginning that created the first sin out of nothing? Won't humans have that problem too? It's a fair question. And I don't want to answer to it. It's not the total, but it's part of it that prompted this audio. People are essentially choosing between, just like Adam and the woman in the garden, people are essentially choosing between God and other humans. Adam fell, Adam looked at the woman who fell, he had to choose between her and God, would he eat the fruit? He chose her over God and that's why he ate the fruit. Then blame God for making her, of course. That's all in Genesis 3. Okay, but there is a non-sin side to that. You have a vertical relationship with God and you have a horizontal relationship with people. Now, most people, they spend their entire lives down here. And as far as vertical relationship with God goes, it's zero. They sing Christmas carols and Oh How I Love Jesus on Sundays. They can spell Jesus. They can spout off and parrot lots of stuff that they heard in Bible class. But it doesn't penetrate. It doesn't become their own desire. It remains something, and here's the key, parroted. And most Christians, I swear, you know, you go to them, and you can ask them a lot of questions about stuff in the Bible. And, oh, uh, yes, God is love. And they can spout Psalm 23, and, and they really mean it. They're very sincere. To them, their parroting passes as knowledge. They believe it. They don't understand it, but they do believe it. But it's not penetrated. It's a, like, how do you want to call it? An umbrella faith. It's something over their head, but it's not inside their head. That's how it's probably going to be in part. This is probably the explanation why we don't sin in part. Is that people are going to be around other people, which is what they're really choosing. And whatever everybody else says, they're going to say it too. And that's how they want it to be. It really still isn't about God. It, 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 you know, God has a relationship to you, but do you want the relationship to Him? The vertical in their minds is really truncated. It's really still essentially a horizontal relationship. They can have more. They don't want more. Now, they're not technically sinning. There's a big difference between sinning, which is a negative direction, and how positive you are. So that determines your spiritual maturation, which determines your maturation, period. I mean, to me, this is a horrible thing to say. I, I really don't look forward to eternity. I look forward to Him and seeing Him, but I got that now. I don't have to die to have it. I really don't like the idea of eternity, but what free alternative could there be? The basic thing is, is boiling out to be you, you get what you want from God and what most people want is a horizontal life with other people that they like doing the things they like forever. And why would it be wrong for them to have that? That's what they want. 
So that's what they get. The big question is, okay, why don't they sin? And the answer is because they're really small. And they're going with the crowd. They're going with the crowd down here. That's what they're voting for. That's what they want. That's the way they're literally programming their own minds to work. And that's what they'll have in eternity. That's how much they'll know God. They'll know God. That's what he promises. Everybody from the least to the greatest will know me. Yeah, and there is a least and there is a greatest. That's in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, which the book of Hebrews builds its book around. In Hebrews uh, chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, which is the first quotation of the verse, and then he reverses the verbs in to bookend it in Hebrews 10, verses 15 through 17. Least to the greatest will know me. Yeah, you can know Jesus Christ at a distance, seeing his fingertips while he waves and walks. Or you can know him intimately. I mean, you know, you sort of know the gal who's your, who's a grocery clerk for the two and a half seconds that you're in the grocery line getting your stuff checked out of the grocery store. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Don't remember her name. You can sort of recognize the face, but you might not remember it 20 minutes later. That's knowing. Not very much. In other words, people are going to want to relate to each other laterally. And the idea of actually relating to God is extremely limited. Because that's the way they want it. Their eyes are full of each other. And look how we talk. That's how it is now. The idea of having a you know personal conversation with God and knowing God and learning as much about Him, most people don't want that. And technically speaking, it's not a sin; it's a preference. So that's another reason why you have free will but no sin in eternity because people choose to be, what do you want to call it, moved, motivated, follow, conform to each other. The herding instinct. It isn't really an instinct, it's a choice. It might start out as an instinct, but by the time you're dead, honey, you chose it. You have the ability to say no. So much so that you can turn around with all the evidence in front of you, like Windows 10 contract, and you can disbelieve it. So in the end, it's really a preference. People prefer to be with other people and have their eyes on people and things and not God. So... That's what they get. So that's how he integrates the hypocrisy too. I mean, at, at heart you have to say, well that, you know, that is and is not hypocrisy. It is because here you are saying, oh how great God, but the thoughts really aren't there. As people worship me with their lips, but what was it? But their hearts are far from me. But then there's also the, the chirping of a child child really thinks, well, I love mommy. child doesn't know anything about love. It makes a child feel warm and fuzzy to say, I love mommy. And it's like loving food. It tastes, the, the child saying it tastes good to the child. Mommy tastes good to the child, but if mommy isn't so nice, I don't love you anymore. I love you, I love you, sick little old blue man. That kind of thing. Huh? It's that kind of honesty, so that's not hypocrisy, but in point of fact, the being is small and focused on what's small, what's horizontal. Think about it. The big point here is that God's going to integrate all that stuff too.
And this is why, primarily, you've got all those verses about, you know, hierarchical societies with kings. It helps those looking sideways to get at least some more information each day about God. Because they aren't looking at him. And they didn't learn how to look at him. And they don't actually have a soul that's built to look at him. They didn't want that. So they don't have that. So then they have to sort of like, by indirections, find directions out. They look at each other and they learn about God like second hand. I don't want to be in that group. But many do. And that's why it turns out the way it is. Shouldn't people get what they want out of heaven?